Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, as Paul said, basically, this talk is about really the last chapter in the, the book, The Gift of the Sea. But I'll do a little bit on the genesis of the book first. Um, one of the things what we'll do here is because Lou's here, and uh, so I'll talk a bit, and then Lou will read um, some extracts from the book on the relevant bit that we're talking about, mostly that last chapter. Um, we'll also put some slides up, but uh, not having used Web and Air Jam before, I think we can get it right, but um, you'll have to excuse any any glitches. There, they'll be our fault. Um, when I was talking to Paul previously, um, and this is in the preface to the book as well, the genesis of the book was really that over the years, over some 30 odd years, I've been collecting books, uh, papers, all sorts of stuff about uh, yachting in the Mediterranean and sailing generally in the Mediterranean. Uh, in some of these uh, in the 19th century, for example, Victorians had a pretty good go at writing writing books and sometimes uh, co-opted quite famous authors like Ellsworthy to do it. Um, the French were down there. Um, there were, you know, the Americans came over and there was there was quite a lot. It was a quite a history of yachting. The sort of turnkey which gave me the start to the book um, was really when I was in a marina in Gocek and the very nice young uh, manager of the marina we, we were in said, would I sign a copy of, of our Turkish pilot? So I said, sure, you know. So in the morning, he duly wandered up, and this was a few years ago, with a first edition. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm really sorry. I'll get you, you know, I'll get you a current edition. Don't worry. And he said, no, you know, I, you know, I took me a long time to get this first edition. And what I wanted is this first edition shows me what this coast was like, what the Turkish coast was like before I was born. I don't think he really meant it to come across like that. But I thought, oh my God, I've become an artifact already. I'm like a bold lump of stone. And then I thought, this is the, the original map of Go Check here along with the map today. I mean, in those days, there were no marinas there. There was a bit of a pier off the municipal pier. Today, you have six marinas tucked around Gocek. And this evolution has happened in a comparatively short space of time. But of course, in the pilots that I've been writing, this is all documented, if you like, in uh, in the, the plans, the photos, uh, and the text. So he had a point, even though it did hurt a bit. I didn't really want to be an artifact, but uh, <laughs> that's what happens sometimes. Um, the book basically follows the history of yachting in the Mediterranean. And so we start this introduction, um, which uh, covers really just definition of terms, methodology, and what the Mediterranean is, is like, you know, what the Mediterranean is. Then we go to the Egyptians, um, who, in terms of the pharaohs and the high priests, are precursors to our oligarchs running around on super yachts these days with winsome women, um, usually not very old ones. Uh, then we have the Greeks, of which there is surprisingly little. But of course, we have the Odyssey, which is the wellspring, really, of for so many of us, certainly for me. Um, and when I first met Lou, I mean, the first book I gave her was the Odyssey. Well, I was shocked to find she hadn't read it. <laughs> um, after that, we have the Romans, and we have the two, two, two poles apart. We have Caligula and his super yachts, basically, um, in the lake above Rome. And we have Catullus, the, the poet who wrote so much about sailing, uh, sailing his yacht. Um, and, you know, from his poems, you can tell he knows about stuff that goes on with, with sailing a boat. 
Um, after that, we go to again to the to the to the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, which is uh, there's not that much. There is some, but you know, for example, there are the kaites, which were used by the Ottomans um, on you know to get back and forth across the Bosphorus. But they were also used for picnics, and some of them are beautifully ornate things. Uh, and there are whole poems written on taking picnics by moonlight uh, on the Bosphorus. Um, then we go after that to the Romantic poets. Um, and of course, Byron and Shelley and the others escaping England for one reason or another, usually because they had a lot of debts um, and also because they were being chased by the fathers and brothers of a certain woman. Um, they went down there and had boats. Both of them had yachts built in uh, Genoa. Um, Shelley, of course, lost his life uh, on his yacht for Flavorno. Um, and there were others down there as well. It's just not as well documented as, as the life of Byron and Shelley is down there. Um, then we have the Victorians who, on that, you know, and I have, there's, I have a whole pile of books by the Victorians written in the 19th century now, most of them really sailing what we would call super yachts these days. There was very little, there wasn't the, the sort of the ordinary person sailing boats down there. After that, we have the Americans who came across curious about uh, what this funny place called Europe was like. Um, and we have you know, people like the very eccentric Gordon Bennett um, on his yachts. They were mostly um, motor yachts. Um, but uh, they, you know, they, they have their own little chunk of history there. Then we have two world wars and the Great Depression. And of course, it's there's not that much happens in the Mediterranean. In fact, very little written about it, even by those who went down there. But what we have here is a really a change where you have smaller yachts doing considerable distances and sailing down to the Mediterranean. Um, and you know, you have McPherson, for example, uh, who you know, late in life decided to go sailing and did incredible voyages down into the Mediterranean and further on. Um, after the war, we have those who somehow, having seen what they did in world, what they had seen in World War II, and having experienced all sorts of things, decided that they would up sticks and leave the UK and sail down to the Mediterranean. And we have a whole, uh, of, of these people, um, Miller, um, we have uh, Penny Minnie, um, who was a young girl from Oxford, went off in the 50s and sailed a converted lifeboat from Malta to Istanbul and back. Um, quite incredible, quite incredible voyages. Um, after that, it gets a bit, bit closer to to my sort of period, but there are things like the super yachts which were around. Um, I have a chapter which is just called, you know, is about super yachts, part one, Greek tragedy, because you had uh, Onassis, uh, Niarchos, and Karas, and in lots of ways, all of their endeavors ended in, in tragedy. They all loved, they loved boats. Um, the Arcos especially um, sponsored the small ships training here in the UK. Um, Karras, on the other hand, um, had a yacht built really in case there was a nuclear war and he had to escape. Um, so, you know, there's that. After that, we get to flotillas. Um, this was a period when I came in and Flotillas really brought sailing for every man. Um, lots of people in those early years um, came up. I was there in 77 um, and, uh, and then through 
two more years really and then skipped it and then had to go back and do another year um, after writing the Greek book, which didn't make very much money. Um, then, you know, you had this, you had this incredible explosion of, of sailing and you started to have people in small yachts sailing down as well. Um, then there's various other things which happen and go through there. And so I go through super yachts, is chapters about um, on a shoestring. Uh, I mean, I have a collection of uh, friends um, and books and papers uh, on people who sail wanderer dinghy. For example, a wanderer dinghy from uh, Levkis in the Ionian through up to down to Egypt, across to Egypt, um, up the up the Nile, back down again, across to Turkey, some four thousand miles in a in a in a wayfarer dinghy. Um, and Steve uh, still lives out in in uh, Levkis. Um, it was it was an incredible part of and formative part of his life. Um, so we get on, and finally we get through a few more chapters, um, from the Periplus of Skylax to the Digital Age, which is what I'll talk about. As I say, Lou's going to read some bits out, uh, and I'll um, fill in. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things is, is that, you know, a lot of us, and no aspersions cast here, are of an age where um, we sailed pre-electronic. Um, when I sail roulette, this 20-foot ply boat down to, down to Greece, um, it, it had a, you know, my navigation was by a grid bearing compass, which was mounted in the cockpit. Um, speed was gauged by eye. I had a red line and some charts marked not for navigation. Um, and, you know, you can say that I was lucky to get there. I think there's something else. You know, there's, there's the act of pilotage. Anyway, Lou. Okay, uh, this is the first of the extracts from, uh, from, from the book. Um, we employ a huge range of modern technology to locate where we are, where we're going, at what speed, whether we're on course, and how long it will take at such and such speed. Satellites beam down our coordinates and printed circuit boards process the information and display it on a screen to give us an apparent certainty as we navigate on the sea. And yet, seemingly old-fashioned aids like Yachtsman's Guides to an Area still thrive. I have a personal interest here and this history for the Mediterranean would not be complete without looking at the history of how we navigate this sea. Just a few decades ago, we had no satellite beaming down our, satellites beaming down our position and navigation was by dead reckoning and the stars along with pilotage skills when closing a harbour or anchorage. In the late 70s, I sailed the 20 foot roulette down from the UK to the Mediterranean with a compass and some charts, not, not for navigation. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Um, there's a thing, you know, when we start here that, you know, Mapping is, for me, one of those things, and for lots of other people as well, um, especially those, to do, you know, people who study, academically study sensation and perception, um, seems to, to be, if not innate, then a thing which is learned very early. And it's natural for human beings. You know, if we're sitting with someone and they go, you know, you know, Rod, what's it like going into, you know, into the Thames? And, you know, if you've got nothing else, you're going to almost certainly do a, a, you know, a rough sketch to show what it's like. Okay, it's not going to be very good. There's sandbags everywhere, but it's better than, you know, that sort of visual aid gives you, gives you a clue. Um, the first, first real map that um, we know of is, is Chapel Hoyek uh, in the Anatolian Peninsula. This is a um, Neolithic settlement um, from around seven and a half thousand BCE. Um, it's what it is is this painting was found 
inside one of the houses because the houses are being excavated there. And it is, because all the houses are there and they're being excavated, it is a map of the village. And even better, it has the volcano um, uh, behind it, which is there. So, you know, there is the, there is the volcano there. And this, you know, this, as I say, is the, the map is probably around 6,500, 7,000 BCE. Um, it's, there are other examples, but I think for me, the Chattel Hoyat map is the one which gives, uh, gives us the best idea of, of why mapping is an innate experience. I mean, there is, there is a there is a, a matter that you know we we can the human brain is an amazing thing for doing spatial arrangements and you know there are things I love for example if you if you have three dots in the corner in the shape of a triangle the brain will recognize it as a triangle not as three dots and there are all sorts of spatial arrangements which we naturally um take to be a to, to be a shape um this you know this means that uh, you know for us you know to draw a map um draw a map on paper uh, or on the dust on the ground uh is is a, is a is a natural you know it's a natural thing um i mean one of the earliest map maps we have is Ptolemy's map um, and sadly as with most of them you know it's we know it's second century CE but uh, the copies we have are all copies from much much later this is a 13th century copy in the British Museum um, the British Library sorry um, and uh, it's you know there had to be a lot of other maps around, but of course, you know, these are lost. You know, the the, the papyrus disintegrates. The 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 vellum is 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 consigned to another task. Uh, you know, to, the parchment is is used for for making something else um, or writing something else down. Um, so there are very few maps around, although there is quite a lot of mention of maps in texts, but we just don't have them. And, you know, there are, I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the good mentions, which I haven't actually put in here, it's in the book, um, is in uh, the play The Frogs, where they talk about maps. And, you know, and we're talking, I think, top of my head, Fourth century BCE here, um, so it's uh, you know there is a there is a cognizance of maps. Um, it's just that they've been lost, unlike um, other things. And uh, for example, we know. Uh, to oh, you've got a bit to do. I've got a bit to do. Ah, yeah. sorry. I'm um, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> absolutely, racing on. Um, I'm just going to go back to, to the map making and the, and the and, uh, extract from the book. Map making is most likely a fundamental part of our cognitive world. The ability to make sense and organize the space around us into a two dimensional form is one way of making sense of it, of understanding the spatial arrangement of the world, or at least the world that is known. Mapping the stars and mapping the planet goes some way to understanding our place in it, at least our geographic place in it. Whatever else the priests, the politicians and shamans derive from that map or add to it, the basic geography and cosmology in the case of stars does not overshadow the basic uses of a map for knowing where you are in the literal sense. In The Nature of Maps, a book that is quoted, the authors conclude that the reason for the common use of mapping as a metaphor for knowing or communicating has finally become clear. The concept of spatial relatedness, which is of concern in mapping and which indeed is the reason for the very existence of cartography, is a quality without which it is difficult or impossible for the human mind to apprehend anything. And that's from The Nature of Maps by Robert Robinson and Pechenik. 
um, I'll come back to 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 you and and, and Ptolemy. Yes, no, <laughs> I was. So we're done for Ptolemy, you know, which is a map which survives, as do so many of the the things we depend upon. When we get to Skylax, for example, um, you know, what we have is is a is an adulterated uh, manuscript, um, which was. Yeah, I'll do him in a moment. Um, okay. Which was uh, lost uh, and then found under a wine barrel, so the stories go, um, uh, in the 10th or 13th century. Um, anyway, in medieval times. Um, in terms of, you know, what we have around us, for example, you know, this, this stuff I love. One of them is the Tower of Winds in Athens, um, which where you know that they have a an amazing understanding of what's going on. It has, it faces exactly towards all the cardinal points of the compass. Um, it has the winds circulating in the right direction for depressions. It used to have a water clock in it. Um, and this was constructed in the first, by the first century BCE or first century CE. Um, it's uh, it, it, at an early time. And of course, this remains because it's made of stone, and it wasn't a um, defense feature, so it didn't get you know, didn't get bombarded like the Acropolis did so much. It's on the way up to the Acropolis and what's left of the Roman Agora. Well worth a visit. Of course, the other thing they have there in the National Museum is the Antikythera uh, computer, um, and this is an amazing find. It was found off the island of Antikythera. Um, and there have been various uh, attempts to reconstruct it, pretty good attempts, um, uh, which are in the, in the museum, National Museum there as well. My point for all of this is, is that, you know, while we've lost the maps, there was evidently a depth of technical knowledge, um, which must have applied to maps and for that matter, to, to, to guides as well. Which brings us to Skylax. <laughs> um, so you're going to do I will I will take it, I, I will take a reading. Um, one of my pet projects has been to research the travels and endeavors of Skylax of Cariander, who wrote what we can call the first periplus or sailing directions assuming we discount the geography of Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Periplus of Skylax was discovered, or more accurately rediscovered, in the 13th century CE, and is basically a description of the Mediterranean proceeding clockwise around the sea. The guide is usually called the Periplus of Pseudo-Skylax, because the original has evidently been re revised later and includes some places and rulers who were not around in the earlier era. Cariander has been identified as the present day Sali Ardasi, uh, which is in the Gulf of Guluk uh, in Turkey, and is unexcavated as yet, possibly because of a fish farm factory on the isthmus of the island. So that's us in Cariander, or mm -hmm. as it's called Sali Ardasi these days, but you can wander around, there's, you know, there's not a lot of, of evident ruins there, but there is some, you know, there's this pillar and there's other bits. And I reckon I know where Skylax's house was in there, <laughs> um, but that's purely conjecture. Um, so Skylax wrote his Periplus, and one of the problems academically is, is whether he's an encyclopedist, um, along the lines of, uh, of others who are around, um, or whether it's actually a guide, to, you know, a sailing guide. To me, it really is a sailing guide. I mean, it's, it's to the point and almost dull, but it tells you how many days or how far um, it is between harbours. It tells you what you're likely to expect there, whether they're friendly or they're going to try and kill you um, and uh, when you can get water there and these sorts of things so it's it is for me you know something more than just purely a, an excited encyclopedist like uh, attempt like Strabo 
or planning. Um, it's it's a it's it is more of a technical um, effect or effort. Um, okay. Yes, you want me to I mean the second second bit on the expedition. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. We have. Um, I mean, when I say you know, it's often thought of as an encyclopedic effort. There are those as well, um, including a nice Italian man uh, professor who who is rather convinced that it's, it, it is a it is a it is a guide, a sea guide. Um, and one of the things that happened is, you know, of course we don't have it, um, but uh, well, we have this copy, which is an adulterated copy, but. That's something. Um, I'm going to do the yeah yeah. So this is uh, taken from 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 a book again. Uh, the Skylax India expedition. The Periplus is attributed to Skylax of Carianda, and this same Skylax is mentioned briefly in Herodotus. Quote: Darius, desiring to know where this Indi Indus empties into the sea sent ships manned by Skylax, a man of Cariander, and others whose word he trusted. These set out from the city of Caspatiros and the Patian country and sailed down the river toward the east and the sunrise until they came to the sea. And voyaging over the westward, they came in the 13th month to the place from which the Egyptian king sent the above-mentioned Phoenicians to sail around Libya. This is from History's Book 4. Um, from this mention of Skylax of Cariander in Herodotus, we would date the Periplus to around 530 to 500 BC. Darius invaded northwest India in 521 BC, and the assumption is that Skylax was sent off to either chart the known boundaries of the Persian Empire and what lay beyond the Indus River, or at an earlier date to scout out the territory for the coming invasion. It's likely that he got to Caspatiros on the Indus, Indus by travelling up and into the Red Sea, though conceivably he could have travelled overland. Although there's not a lot of detail in the Black Sea and the Periplus, it does contain a list and some detail on the Black Sea coast. One of my pet theories, entirely speculative, is that Herodotus used much of the information on Central and Southern Asia for his histories, as there is no good evidence he travelled there and he lived just down the road from Skylax of Cariander. The map, by the way, is also speculative on my part. Yes, I was just going to say that. <laughs> this, is, this is my map of where I think Skylax travelled, but it has no authority whatsoever. Don't put any money on it. <laughs> um, the, the bit about Herodotus, I mean, Herodotus, much as we love him, is... Unknown. He takes he takes lots of scrappy information from around the world. I mean, especially his stuff on India and other places where Skylax probably did travel to. So for me, you know, I mean, if you lived just across the way and here was this guy who had actually been to these places, and for the Persians, for Darius, Skylax would definitely have written this trip up. Um, but of course it's been lost, then, I don't know, I reckon Herodotus could have gone, yeah, thanks very much, mate, I'll take that. Um, but I'm not going to mention you. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a little footnote. Um, but anyway, um, so... <laughs> thank you, mate. Yes. No, so that's, that's Skylax. So, I, you know, I put that in there. To some extent, it's... It's a bit of a red herring on uh, there, but it is the first, if you like, for me, the first sailing guide. Um, after that, we have a bit of a gap until we get to portal lands. Um, and most of the portal lands we have are really nicely illuminated copies um, that were done usually by monks and, uh, and put in the libraries uh, of the rich and of the monasteries. Um, they're unlikely to be the actual portulans that the trading skippers and merchants used. Um, and of course, these, these books 
would have been gold. I mean, you know, they're, they're what, a, what a skipper relies on for, for his trade. Um, so the, there were almost certainly more workaday books than the ones which we have now, which are kept for posterity. Um, so you need to... I'll put, put the next one up. Yeah. Do you want me to read yeah. the excerpt? Um, no, I'll just, I'll just go on. I mean, you okay. know... One of the, I mean, you know, these things, including charts, which were which were around, uh, were good prized. I mean, Henry the Navigator in Portugal um, put a death penalty on anybody who who gave any of his enemies or, or fellow countries um, copies of Portuguese documents, or most certainly any others that they had. Um, so, yeah. Portolans, from the Italian Portolano, meaning literally a collection or book of sailing directions, a sailing pilot, first appeared sometime in the 14th century. The importance of these early Portolans has never been in doubt, and they are considered to be the forerunners of modern cartography in Europe. They have been described as a unique achievement, not only in the history of navigation, but in the history of civilized, civilization itself. Uh, that's a, a quote from Tony Campbell on a, a, from another boat, book. Uh, these sailing directions, complete with plans of islands, approaches to anchorages and harbors, and detail of harbors along the way, were not for contemplation in libraries and monasteries, but were tools of the trade for craft working around the coasts and islands of the Mediterranean. For the captains and navigators on trading ships, portolans were essential aids, enabling them to navigate cargo safely from one place to another as quickly and safely as possible. The portolan also gave details of conspicuous objects on the shore, like castles and towers, which could be ticked off on passage and sighted for the approach to a destination. This is navigation by the Mark I eyeball that we still all use today. Sailors are also aware of the signs on the surface of the water indicating currents and possible dangers to navigation. Given you can often clearly see the bottom at 10 metres in the Mediterranean, a lookout forward watching for dangers and shallows would be normal procedure to warn of reefs and shoal water. Oddly enough, um, and we'll, we'll come to this, yeah, hold on for a while for the okay. really rest. Um, it, it's these... Portulans, which up through the ages became more and more detailed, um, used rum lines to get a, you know, for, for directions. Um, and, you know, the navigation using these became a great deal more sophisticated. I mean, there was still, in lots of ways, people penciling and drawing their own Portulans up until the 19th century. And Emrays, for example, in their collection of some of the books they have up there, have some wonderful old journals, I, I think, that, that, you know, they call them. But they are, in effect, Portulans, um, with ink sketches of the harbours, um, directions for getting in there, dangers, all of that sort of stuff, which um, is useful when you're sailing around. Now, one of the lesser known to some people, people who uh, who, who did a Portulans, is um, Perry Reyes. Perry Reyes is known for, for the segment of his real map, which of his, his world map, um, which shows the Atlantic and is in fact one third of a, of a, of a whole map. The other two thirds have never been found. Um, again, this was found in 23, I think, by a German or Austrian um, in the library in Top Capi Palace. Um, but uh, Perry Reyes is known for this, but in fact, his Book of the Sea, his Kitabi, is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a lot, is a lot more wonderful um, book. And uh, it's, it, it deals with all sorts of things. Um, I think I you've the, got a bit, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Apart from the use of waterlands and these new navigation techniques by ships engaged in commercial trade, the various nation states around the shores of the Mediterranean also had an interest in aids to navigation for their navies, none more so than the Ottoman Empire. 
in the early 16th century Piri Reis drew a chart of the world. It is, it is Piri Reis Portalan, the Kitab al Bahari, a book of maritime matters that is most interesting. Uh, I'm just going to move on to that slide. Um, like the Genoese and Pisan Portalans and others, this shows in detail the Mediterranean with rum lines and plans of harbours and anchorages, along with pilotage notes. The introduction to the Kitabi has detailed notes on navigation techniques and general things like weather and currents, dealing with storms, the compass, the use of portaland charts and astronomical navigation. Various versions of the Kitabi have survived and it seems to have been a much copied uh, book for the Ottoman fleet. Mm. And no doubt for other people as well when Ottoman ships were captured. Um, it's, you know, it is, it is as Lou says, um, or as I say actually, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, it, you know, it has sections on navigation, seamanship, currents, wind and weather, using a compass. I mean, you know, this is, this is like, uh, you know, the Admiralty, you know, um, directions for, for, for seamen, um, you know, in terms of, of doing it. And of course, it also has the most wonderful um, plans like, uh, like this one, uh, but, you know, detailed plans of harbours as well. Um, the Admiralty, which, which comes along and really starts with Beaufort, um, who himself spent quite a lot of time down in the Mediterranean, mostly in Turkey, um, surveying, um, uh, changed things around. And what happened is that the old um, admiralty portal lands, if you like, became divorced so that um, you had chart sheets and you had sailing directions, pilots, um, and the pilots are just text tables, um, whereas the, you know, and the chart sheets like here, and this in fact is one of Beaufort's um, plans from, uh, from, the, from, the, from the coast of Turkey, um, which was still the only plan you could buy up until 20, 25 years, 25 years ago when it was withdrawn. I mean, it was still his original 1812, 1813 survey. Um, and so and I still have them. They are the most wonderful works of art as far as I'm concerned. The, the detail and the, the care and attention to, to drawing these charts is, is second to none. Um, my yes, excerpt do. from this, this section. In the 19th century, the concept of writing sailing directions and charts or maps of the area being described in the same volume fell out of favour. And in Britain, the Admiralty published sheets of charts, including hover plans, and volumes of written sailing directions containing only text and tables. This segmentation of charts and text by hydrographic departments would survive into the next century and into the 21st century. Paradoxically, it was the yachtsman's pilot that carried on the conventions of the Portalands once again united charts and text. And so it was. I mean, I have a, a great deal of respect for these early um, surveyors. I mean, you know, people like Spratt and Beaufort um, and others um, were amazing surveyors and uh, they weren't interested just purely in you know plumbing the depths of the ocean and drawing a, drawing a map oh no they were you know they were interested in the culture the flora and fauna the geology and many of them like Beaufort um, wrote books you know he wrote his Caramania um, which is on a section of the Turkish coast um, and, uh, you know, they were Spratt and uh, his able lieutenant, um, his name I've forgotten, um, were around doing great things and, you know, were much loved by their, by their crew and their midshipmen. There were others, like Corrie, um, 
who were not so well liked. And Curry is famously recorded in the map and the approaches to to Mudros and the, the, the harbour plan of Mudros on Limnos. Um, and there are four mountains down there, and they're still there. They're still on the charts to this day, named like that. So they've they're named backwards, Yam, Denman, Yorick, uh, Ebb. And so may Cory be damned if you read them. You know, that's backwards, and so you read them forwards. And that's what they thought of, who knows, we might be scribbling things on some of our harbour plans. About <laughs> but, uh, so from Borderlands to Modern Yachtsman's Guides. Okay. Um, Another excerpt from, from this chapter. Uh, at the age of 16, H.M. Denham was aboard H.M.S. Agamemnon in the Dardanelles, where he served as midshipman. Despite the disaster that was Gallipoli, the Mediterranean must have burrowed its way into Denman's being, and when he retired from the Navy in 1947, he sailed down to the Mediterranean and spent much of his time sailing there. He based his yacht, a beautiful 45-foot yawl called Herald, in Malta, and every year set off to explore the Eastern Mediterranean and research his series of cruising guides for yachts. His first book, The Aegean, was published in 1963, closely followed by The Adriatic in 1967, The Tyrrhenian in 1969, The Ionian Islands to Rhodes in 1972, and Southern Turkey, The Levant and Cyprus in 1973. Some of the guides, like the Aegean, went into five editions. Denham's books were in many ways a throwback to the Portland style with added historical interest. Like many of his generation, he had a wide education that pulled in the classics so that he was familiar with the ancient sites dotted around the coast and included brief details on them. Although the books were aimed at cruising yachtsmen, they can change titles, which is why you have the Eastern Mediterranean there and then some taking a Levant. They, um, but all published by Murray, there has to be something else to it. Um, and Denham had that. Um, so we'll get now to, ah, oh, that was Harold. Yeah. Um, do you want me to move on? Buchanan, to... I think, but I'm not sure about that. Shall I do the first bit yes. on your, your, yeah, yeah. your writing guide? So. Yeah. Writing yachting guides, the inside view. Like all good things that happened to us, it was an accident I started writing pilots for the Mediterranean. It began in 1978 when I was skippering a flotilla around the Saronic and eastern Peloponnese in Greece. On the first flotilla, I had to take my little fleet around to harbours and anchorages I had never been to. Giving the morning briefing was a nightmare. From the old Fathoms charts, I gleaned enough information to suggest courses, bearings, dangers to navigation to be avoided, and then announced I would definitely be in the harbour or anchorages, anchorage I had never been to. The little engine on the Cobra 850 lead boat was redlined so I could get in first and assume a pseudo-knowledgeable insouciance on, on the quay as I helped the flotilla to berth. After several years working for the charter company, I decided I should write a yachtsman's guide for Greece as interest, an interesting diversion for a year or so before returning to life in New Zealand. 40 years later, and I still haven't got back to life in New Zealand, and the odds are stacked against it ever happening. I think it might be more than 40 now. <laughs> I know, I know. That's all right. Just, just I mean, this picture shows the first plans. What happened is, in that first year, um, I thought, well, it would be handy for the people on Fertilla to have plans of, of the harbours and... and also a little bit about them, so a little bit about the places they're going to, a bit about the history, the tavernas, the whatever else there was, you know, that you wanted to put in. So I made up these booklets um, for this area, which was originally the Saronic, and then uh, for the Ionian where we moved to, so that there were these plans um, of, the, of the area. Um, I then set off... Um, to to go and do stupidly um, a guide to the Greek waters, a guide to Greek waters pilot, um, and I didn't really think about the extent of what I was doing. Um, 
And I have to say, I probably nearly had a nervous breakdown by the time I got up to northern Greece. And by that time, it was October and the weather was getting pretty miserable. Um, but it also, there were a few ups and downs along the way. Um, it, when I first started out, I started out in March of 1980, um, going down around the Peloponnese. Um, and I sort of got, got down to the bottom, got around the corner. And I'd written a, you know, a couple of chapters by then for the, for the Greek waters pilot. Um, so I looked at them and I thought, this reads a bit like an academic treatise. I mean, who's going to want to read this stuff? You know, it's just too, it qualifies everything, which is, of course, what you have to do all the time in academia. Um, it qualifies everything. People don't want, you know, don't want all of that. They want to have something they can actually read. So I had to rip them up and start again. That was a bit of a bit of a bad moment um, for me. Along the way, of course, the authorities had no idea what I was doing and they were still worried. I mean, pretty early on, I learned the Greek word for spy, which is katascopus, um, if it ever happens to you. And I was arrested as a spy several times. The worst time was in Plumerian on the bottom of Lesbos. And, um, and what I used to do is I had a a fishing line tied off in half meters with knots with a with a with a, a sinker at the end so that it looked like i was fishing except of course when you're doing that along the quay all the local boys want to come and watch you and see what you're catching <laughs> it's got no hooks it's not catching anything i'm just trying to get the depths um but what happened is i was usually on my own at this stage you know sort of surveying harbors by day and typing them up. This was in the days of typewriter and tipex and carbon paper uh, at night. But down the Peloponnese, I towed a little German yacht into an anchorage because his engine had broken down. And Dietrich said, you know, can I come sailing with you sometime? So sure enough, we're over in the eastern Spirades and uh, Dietrich came out. And I had no idea what Dietrich did. But in any case, I was in Plumerian, a policeman came down, said, you're under arrest because you're a spy, spying for the Turks, um, and took me up to the police station. And I was sort of a bit used to this by now and didn't think much of it because usually it ended reasonably amicably. Sadly, in this case, they rang Athens and things weren't looking very good. After I'd been there a couple of hours, Dietrich had gone around and couldn't find me. So... He came up to the police station to report my loss. Anyway, I've never seen a man change so much. Dietrich came in, he was a German man, and um, came in, looked around, said, what's going on in German? And then pulled out this badge. I didn't know he was a policeman. So he had this international police warrant. And anyway, the Greeks there were, were great. They said, no problem. Um, Coffee, cognac, um, <laughs> and I was released. I mean, ever since I've wanted one of those badges, I mean, <laughs> one of those cards, it's just, you know, it would make it so much easier. Um, it, it's an odd thing that, you know, I mean, we still uh, make, the, make the, the harbour plans, really, in the same way that we used to, except... We've got a few things like a laser distance finder and several hand bearing compasses. Um, and so we still draw the plans pretty much in the way that um, I used to in the very beginning. Um, what we do is we draw the plans up like this here. We make a rough plan first in pencil, um, triangulate it, get it all correct do the depths and everything else, and then draw up the, the plan like this and send it off to MRAs who make it look really nice. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting. People say, okay, why, you know, why aren't you using a, a tablet, you know, when you're out in the dinghy doing things? Try it once, but 
Funny enough, tablets don't really like the salty puddle on the bottom of a dinghy. It um, just doesn't do them much good. And in any case, you know, I, I find it quite hard to draw a plan on a tablet tracing it out compared to a bit of paper and a pencil. Paper and pencil rules, okay? <laughs> um, so, digital. Golly. Chart plotters. Am I doing, yeah? Let's move on the, on the slide to yeah. something that's, there oh. we are. Chart plotters. There's a good reason that chart plotters and other devices come up with a warning to the effect that these charts are an aid to navigation and should not be used as a primary source of navigation. Navionics, one of the main players in, the, in electronic cartography, have this to say. The principles of prudent navigation imply that skippers understand that electronic charts are an aid to navigation to be used in addition to official charts and multiple sources of information, including sailing directions, cruising guides, radar, sonar, and most importantly, common sense and good eyesight. So I think it'd be possible, you know, we could spend a whole evening talking about digital cartography and raster and vector charts and, you know, the merits and demerits of them. Um, what I would say is that there is, and this is just an example of Castellarizo, um, where, you know, that's the track of us going in there. No, we don't have wheels. Um, it's, uh, you know, things are getting better in terms of cartographic terms, but not not really for places that are out of the way. Um, for example, in the Panama Canal, when we're in the Panama Canal, that's obviously so well charted that it shows, you know, it shows us where we are in the lock. I mean, you know, in the exact position. But of course, you don't have to stray very far from that to the islands on the other side in the Pacific uh, and chug around there and find out that in one case on the chart, I wasn't sure it kept it kept morphing into two two islands, um, and then it morphed back into one island. And this was this was just a, a you know the the seaming of the chart hadn't been done properly. But the other thing is is that you get a lot of instances like this. You know, people will often say even in even in Greece and Turkey. You know, I'm anchored here, but my chart plotter shows me anchored halfway up the hill. Um, it's it it is a problem. Vector charts, of course, have their own real problems, um, and this is where I you know I may sound old here, that I think everybody should really have passage charts with them, paper passage charts, because it's, you know, it's big and you can look at it and you can see if there are any reefs. In, for example, in Tonga, when you're in Tonga, Nukalofa, you're going from the tropics that, you know, across to Oku in New Zealand. Um, that's a, you know, that's a passage like coming from the Azores to, to the UK. You know, you're moving into, into, a different, into different weather systems. Um, and you can get some quite severe little bombs coming across there. Uh, between Tonga and New Zealand, there's Minerva Reef. And I was sitting in, in the bar, as you do, in Tonga, talking with people. And I said, is anybody stopping at Minerva Reef? And literally out of a group of six of us, there were three who looked blankly and said, Minerva, where's Minerva Reef? And I said, well, it's, it's on the way. It's almost on your direct track to, to New Zealand. And they sort of went, oh. And this is because on, especially on vector charts, um, you have to zoom in to find out everything that's going on. You have a big passage chart. It will show Minerva Reef as a dot, maybe, but it will say Minerva Reef. And so that gives you a bit of a clue as to, as to what's going on. You can't stop at Minerva Reef, by the way. It's not the most comfortable. <laughs> and all the crayfish have gone, if you heard that story. Um, mm -hmm. But 
that's the that's the thing. I mean, we came across several instances of people doing their passage planning on a chart plotter or a laptop and coming to grief. Uh, I mean, for example, when you go from doesn't matter whether it's Fiji or from um, uh, not New Caledonia up from there, um, Vanuatu uh, to Australia. It's a zigzag course around the reefs. Way before you get to the barrier reef, there's lots of other reefs out there. On a on a passage chart, you can look at it and go ding 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 ding. There they are. That's you know that's what I'm going to do. And then if you you know if needs be, you can you can look at the detail um, on your chart plot or your laptop, whatever you're using. Um, but uh, I feel. The other thing I feel also is that there's been a decline in pilotage. Sort of, you know, the sort of pilotage I'm sure lots of you learnt um, in the early days when we didn't have uh, as many aids, electronic aids, as we have now. And uh, that just about does it. You can do Q&A now, and it doesn't have to be on the book. Oh, one thing I will say if we just go, yes. If you think you'd like the book, it's distributed by MRAs. Um, or I think I've got eight or ten copies left here, which for RIN, um, you can go to the Buy Books uh, button on Tanifar Press and go and then go to the Gift of the Sea. And there are two buttons, one's for non-associations and the other one further down. The second PayPal button is for £26. Um, and I'll scribble in it if you want, although my bank manager tells me my signature is worth zero. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to hand back to uh, to Paul now, if that's OK. And, and then uh, I think mm -hmm. uh, if any of you have got any questions, if you've uh, put them in on the on the on the chat line, uh, we'd be happy to happy to answer.